Wearing your influences on your sleeve, not a bad thing. But sometimes it's good to get away from the classics and push in a new direction. That's where growth lives. And it's how a lot of genre fiction finds new legs while still paying respects to the OGs. As much as folks love good old Howard Phillips, we've got to admit that his peak output was around a century ago. A lot of the themes, localities, and attitudes towards certain things are, well, out. Dated. HP laid the groundwork for an entire genre, inspired millions, and was reliably terrifying, but it's probably time to look to the new generation of cosmic horrorers. Hello horror heads, and welcome back to the scariest channel on YouTube, Top 5 Scary Videos. I'm your horror host, Keegan Hughes, and today we're taking a look at the Top 5 Scary Cosmic Horror Stories not written by HP Lovecraft. Take one last look at objective reality without mush brain, because we're going to be staring down the abyss very soon. Before we get started, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe for more literary lunacy. Perfect. Let's begin. Coming in at number 5, we've got Vastarian by Thomas Ligotti. A good place to start when trying to find cosmic horror outside of the established granddaddy's work is with Ligotti's tale of a man driven mad by his love for a book. Seems like a lot of Lovecraft fans may find parts of themselves here. Vastarian is a short story from the collection known as Songs of a Dead Dreamer. The anthology is split into three parts, Dreams for Sleepwalkers, Insomniacs, and The Dead, with Vastarian taking up residence in the third. All the tales in Ligotti's collection are clear Clearly influenced by cosmic horror, with each part becoming darker. The tale we'll discuss plays in the cliche that every book has an ideal reader by introducing us to Victor Kirion. Victor loves his dreams, so much so that he'd rather be asleep than awake. These aren't lovely flights of fancy though, they are dark, warped visions of a reality that's fallen apart. He refers to it as a beautiful land of shadows. Not everyone's cup of tea, but Mr. Kirion is happy. Soon he comes across a bookshop full of seemingly boring tomes, but a strange dark man brings him to the back and introduces him to a volume detailing the world of Vastarian. This place reminds him so intensely of his dreams that he has to have it. There's no way he can leave without this book, for it speaks to him on a deeper level than he could have ever imagined. Commentary on literary cultists, maybe? The folks so obsessively devoted their literary gods that they'll defend that relationship jealously, or even religiously? Once Kirion takes the book home, his dreams begin to change. It seems like an outside influence has come in and infected his perfect world. Things aren't exactly what they seem, and madness is waiting just around the corner. Coming in at number four, we've got the Ballad of Black. Black Tom by Victor Laval. Remember the horror at Red Hook? Yeah, most of us would rather forget. They can't all be winners, can they? For all of the lastingly terrifying stories Lovecraft wrote, there were some that he just couldn't make compelling, or largely coherent, or not horribly xenophobic. Thankfully, over 90 years later, Victor Laval retold the story with some new elements to make it both fresh and palatable. The Ballad of Black Tom mirrors a lot of themes and elements originally present in the horror at Red Hook, but this time presents them in a different light. A much more flattering one, too. It tells the tale of Tommy Tester, Brooklyn-based supernatural hustler and musician. By taking on a little side gig involving some Necronomicon-adjacent deliveries, he ends up embroiled in a scheme involving the Great Old Ones. As things get dark, the story switches to the view of Detective Malone, who some will recognize from the source material. Providing an additional viewpoint and revisiting some of what made Red Hook so scary to begin with, this is a smart move to keep things interesting. By taking a look at 20s New York with all of the benefits of being alive in a modern era, Laval is able to pen a smart and topical retelling of this story. It compares cosmic indifference to racist malice and brutality, and even though some see it as a direct rebuttal to Red Hook, the Ballad of Black Tom still manages to get some terrifying cosmic horror in. Somehow, and I know this might seem a little crazy, it finds a way to connect the inhumanity of the universe to the inhumanity of people. Definitely an interesting way to interpret Lovecraft's work. Dropping in at number three, we've got The Cypher by Kath Koja. Ah, the 90s. Home to some of the best book covers of all time, bar none. Thankfully, it wasn't all just for show. There were some good stories between the covers. In her debut novel, Kath Koja takes a weird hole in the basement of someone's apartment building and makes it an existentially terrifying, disease-ridden read. Originally titled The Fun Hole, I wonder why that was dropped, this book will take a look at a doomed couple. Nicholas and Nakota should not be together by any means. They're both full of venom and hatred, but something keeps them coming back. I guess it's the strange hole in the storage room that they're both unhealthily obsessed with. This is another thing that shouldn't be there. But the fact that it's unexplainable and somewhat explorable through the use of 90s video capture technology makes it impossible to ignore. It pulses and exudes an era of wrongness, and somehow this manages to be magnetic. Could be a commentary on both the characters and their life choices. I'm terrible for being drawn to horrid media? Nah. If the characters and subject matter don't disturb you, the prose will. The cipher is written to make you upset at every turn. 
It reeks of disease and cancer. Odd sentence structure, hypnotic pacing, malignant terrors within the fun hole. This is a magnificent piece of otherworldly terror. Plus, Ko just somehow managed to write this while taking care of her young child. Maybe that's what inspired the extreme darkness. Cruising in at number two, we've got Blind Sight by Peter Watts. Fans of hard sci-fi should have their ears perked up right now. Oh, and folks with an interest in nihilism too. Maybe people who like their fiction very, very technical as well. Has this piqued any interests? Perfect. Blindside is a first contact story involving artificial intelligence, space vampires, and nine-legged spider things. Very cool. It opens with some choice phrases like, if we're not in pain, we're not alive, and you will die like a dog for no good reason. This gives you a pretty good idea of what direction the book is heading in. By addressing themes like identity and consciousness, Blindsight makes readers wonder if they're even anything at all. It's cosmic in a more universal sense. It doesn't necessarily anthropomorphize or idolize the uncaring forces of the universe. There are no great ones or outer gods here. Instead, the universe just sorta is. There's a spacecraft known as the Rorschach that seemingly communicates with the humans aboard the Theseus. Not exactly subtle names here, but they work. The Rorschach appears to be deliberately making attempts to correspond with the Theseus, but later on it's made clear that it may not actually know what it's saying. The beings on board, though, have abilities beyond the scope of humanity and operate on a level beyond our comprehension. They don't really care about us, and we couldn't possibly understand them. You see where this is going? While a lot of hard sci-fi can get overly technical and difficult to parse, Watts does a commendable job of making it accessible enough for folks who are entering from other literary spheres. And for every big idea, there is a big scare to go along with it. But just don't expect that everything will wrap up in one tight little package. And finally, at number one, we've got The Croning by Laird Barron. By introducing the often hard to visualize themes of cosmic horror to a doomed love story, Laird Barron finds storytelling gold in The Croning. It's the tale of a man desperately in love with his wife who is deeply involved with something occult. The children of old leech, if you will. The big twist though, is that our protagonist, Donald Miller, is in the early stages of Alzheimer's. He and his wife have been together for decades, and he's followed her around the world as she sought out strange and supernatural events and objects. The plot bounces back and forth between Don in the 80s, full of life, totally cognizant of the strange events happening around him, and Don now, confused and amnesia-stricken. By dealing with the amnesiac trope in a different way, the audience is presented with some extremely effective dramatic irony. As we move between the time periods, readers become more aware of the danger Don is in and how deeply entrenched his wife is in the cult. However, as he recalls details from his past, he also forgets due to his condition. He wants to believe that he's just imagining things and that the supernatural beings aren't real, and thanks to his lack of permanent memories, they seem to be just a silly story that he's misremembering. But the threat is real, and everyone but Don knows it. Creative in its execution, terrifying in its delivery, The Croning is a shining achievement in modern cosmic horror literature. So, what did you think of the list? How many of these have you read before? Any you might pick up sometime soon? What's your favorite non-HP cosmic horror story? Make sure you let me know down in the comments. Speaking of comments, let's take a look at some of the more watery ones from the top five scary haunted museums you should never visit. King Ivan said, I went to Zach Baggins' haunted museum in Vegas. The museum is inside an actual haunted building. Hey, if you're getting a golden rule, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Although it does sound like a fun time. Ashley Brown says, if Ben Stiller taught me one thing, it's that male models can't not die in a freak gasoline fight accident. Can't not die, huh? What about Mr. Blue Steel himself? He survived. Marianne Ryu says, you should do a part two. Well, if you ask so politely, I might have to oblige. Great nose on that smiley face too. Ursa Minor Jim says, no mention of the Hughes Museum in Toronto? Its sole exhibit is a cursed boudoir portrait of a sexy, bespectacled nuge clad only in boxer shorts, black socks, and a wristwatch. Legend has it that the gaze of this so-called weak, spineless man of temptations is so powerful and alluring it can distract an entire YouTube horror audience within mere seconds. Unfortunately, that collection is not open to the public, nor is it likely to ever be. And Scott Snyder says, first comment. There are no words to describe the immense pride swelling in my bosom upon viewing this comment. Congratulations, Scott, and Godspeed. That's all the time we have for today. Before I attempt to repair an AC unit with a ruptured free online, make sure to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe for more inhuman interest. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.